Welcome to the School of Theology and Prayer at the Church of the Ascension and St. Agnes, Washington, DC. I'm Sarah Coakley, assisting priest and theologian in residence in the parish, and I'm delighted to uh, hear you are all engaged this morning uh, in the first of a four-part series that we are starting today on the subject of prayer in a time of pandemic and social unrest. I'm particularly glad this morning to welcome um, a very old and dear friend of mine, Father Martin Smith, who um, has agreed to be our main interlocutor and speaker this morning on the topic that we're starting with, how do I begin again when prayer seems impossible? Father Martin is one of the best known spiritual directors um, and retreat directors in the Anglican and Episcopal traditions. And he's written a number of really superb contemporary books on prayer and its problems. I particularly recommend The Word is Very Near You, which was life-changing for me when I first read it. And I think we'll be hearing some of the themes from that book this morning. But he has a particular ability to uh, deal with the special contemporary problems that we find with even beginning on the adventure of the life of prayer and attending to the urgent challenges which are attacking us at the moment, those of anxiety, of sickness and of social unrest. I'd also like to introduce before we start, Amanda Bourne, um, who is our technological and theological assistant in the background in these webinars. She has recently been appointed as curate to the Chapel of the Cross at Chapel Hill in North Carolina. Thank you for being with us, Amanda, and managing all the background issues for us. Um, just to explain once more, if you haven't been on one of these sessions before, if you want at any time during the discussion to send a question in, you need to wake up the uh, icons at the bottom of your screen and go to Q&A at the right hand end, where you can click open a box, type your question and your name into it, and then don't forget to uh, uh, press return. That will send it through to Amanda, who will be collecting these questions as we progress. And we will pause once halfway through the hour and another time more lengthily at the end of the hour to answer some of your questions. If your particular question doesn't get answered, it doesn't mean it doesn't get to us. And I always collect them afterwards and I'm glad to hear from people directly if they want to engage later. So let me now turn to Father Martin and put it to him. Martin, let me speak for many people when I say that I spent a lot of time since March in a certain degree of anguish about my prayer life. Um, it's been like a very lengthy and searing retreat, but at the same time, the levels of anxiety and uncertainty about the future financially and in other ways, and the sickness that surrounds us and the worries about racial injustice, all these crowd in upon us. So help us to start again. I know you've chosen three particularly core questions that you want to attack. So. I'm going to hand over to you to introduce two of them, and then we'll pause and have some questions before progressing to the last one. Thank you. Sarah, thank you. Um, greetings, everyone. And my first point might be that finding prayer to be impossible is actually a, a moment of truth for us. Because if we thought it was possible before, we might have been self-deceived. One of my favorite quotations is from a mid 20th century Anglican theologian who was also a spiritual master, Austin Farrer, who in a famous sermon says, how can you pray? It is nearly impossible to pray, but praying, out of, uh, praying ourselves out of prayerlessness is just what prayer is. You've got to pray yourself out of prayerlessness. And the other thing, I'm going to tell a very politically incorrect joke that's 100 years old, which is um, poking fun at the Irish, as many jokes have, where an English tourist in Connemara asked a local farmer how to get to a certain town that was his destination. And the farmer says, if I was going there, I wouldn't start from here. 
And this joke is an indispensable sort of koan or enlightenment moment because it holds up a mirror to our own thought processes, which is there must be a place to start praying from. But how do I get to that place? Because here is not the right place to get there. But of course, there is no other place from except where we are just now and who we are. And I think what is very creative and how God must really yearn to be with us in this moment of finding prayer impossible is that we might possibly wake up to what prayer actually is. It's not telling God what we think God wants to hear, but it's expressing and offering who we are just now, whatever that may be, in the dim belief which we hope will grow over time, that God is wholly here for us. You can't divide God up and get a bit of God's attention. Everybody gets all of God. This is the, the paradox of belief in God, is God is all ears for each one of us. It's not, God is not like the old woman with a shoe who has so many children that he has to sort of triage. Just as we are, we are the, the world to God. We mean the world to God. Um, the microcosm is a great definition of who a human person is. We mean the world to God, and therefore each one of us is the, is the suffering and struggling world for God. And God wants to hear who we are. Of course, we make the excuse, well, God knows already, so there's no point in saying so, which is a very closely related to that absurd thing that couples say to one another, I needn't tell you I love you because you know already, which is hardly the point. Expressing who we are. We claim it, we recognize it, we offer it, and we open it up to change. As long as we're holding our cards to our chest, nothing will happen. So if we start where we are, we recognize that what we have to offer to God at this point may be painful, confusing, anxious, ungainly, unattractive, um, repulsive to ourselves, um, but also mixed, mixed with other emotions of gratitude, of pity, of awakening, of empathy, and the truthfulness of a moment of turmoil like this is that we recognize that ambivalence is the human condition. We feel opposite things at the same time. The only original uh, spiritual statement I've ever made that wasn't sort of borrowed was, ambivalence is a sacred emotion. When we're conscious of how mixed our feelings are, and somehow how conflicted they are, then we're on to the real thing called the human condition. Now, if there is a kind of preliminary to prayer that we may need to do in these times of turmoil, anxiety, where we feel mute before God, um, pre-prayer, which is very important, in some cases it's almost foreplay, in other cases it's just like pre the preparatory thing we have to do, is get in touch and find names for what we're actually feeling at the moment, which is the endeavor of emotional honesty, which we actually have to do as couples with our loved ones, our children and stuff. What am I actually feeling? And that's not so easy, is it? Emotional honesty is the hardest thing about being human. And what makes prayer impossible, as we said, is not a technical issue, but more a sense of, oh, how do I speak the truth of who I am and what I'm experiencing and feeling? 
so that I can recognize that God is mysteriously surrounding this or participating in it in some way. Uh, I love the very short poem by Matthew Arnold, below the surface stream, shallow and light of what we say we feel, below the stream as light of what we think we feel, there flows with noiseless current strong, obscure and deep, the central stream of what we feel indeed. It's a very canny short poem um, that says, it is quite, what makes prayer hard is, is what makes emotional honesty hard, which is, can we start by expressing what we're actually feeling to God? Can we start One, where we somewhere else and right we're not, trying, we're not trying to please some potentate or taskmaster right. or to prove our ability in this difficult and impossible task right now a log book or a simple book like this is very useful because of its two page facing pages and one preliminary thing we can do to prayer is have one which is side to be more or less the sunny side of the street and the other side that's deep in deep shadow. And just a simple action of writing down or jotting down is universally acknowledged psychologically to be a way of, of identifying and bringing out into the open. So if you have two pages, you can say, what am I feeling on the shadow side? I feel self-pity, I feel rage and vindictiveness against those who politically disagree with me. I feel scared to death about what's going to happen around the corner. These are a whole series of emotions. Um, and on the other side, there are things like, I feel strangely uh, lighter. I feel I'm starting to let go of all these things I'm taking for granted. I do feel tremendous loss. Oh my God, no more cinemas, no more theaters for a while. The arts are going to pieces, the people are starving, they're going to be evictions. But on the other hand, there are other feelings of empathy. And so, so if we can identify both aspects of these feelings, and all we can do is launch into them with God. And sometimes the secret is to forget all idea about a coherent conversation with God or anything spelt out. The spiritual masters are great believers in blurting things out in short bursts, rather than spelling everything out and sort of feeling we're going to speechify to God. And in some sense, uh, a lot of it will simply be identifying emotions and saying to, and, and what I say, taking emotions, experiences, and feelings, and tilting them towards God. We can either tilt them to ourselves in self-reflection, self-concern, or we can tilt them to God, in some sense, the invisible face of God, and say, here, make of this what you can. Make of, um, I offer this to you. And of course, this is the most neglected definition of prayer, which is, I can only offer who I am just now, and actually it's a mess. And this is who I am, but I offer, I offer it, and I make it over to you. And in that, we know that it opens it to change, because you're already starting to let go, especially with issues of anxiety. Some of us are having a very rough time, because we might have had childhoods that set us up with the wiring for anxiety already. So the insulation is smoking at the moment because there's too much current going through wiring that was very shaky to start up. So the other thing is, restarting prayer should drive us back to the gospels and realize that whatever we're experiencing is going to be illuminated by Christ who was in a time of crisis, who spoke of the reign of God coming in a critical period of time for his own people, who he believed were, war were being led over a precipice by blind guides. That, that, that it was a critical and catastrophic time. And instead of breathing 
eternal truths to Galilean pe peasants. He was arousing people to uh, offer themselves to God for the coming of the reign of God. And Christ, uh, about prayer is we must identify and honor our asking of God, our seeking of God, our knocking. In 40 years of spiritual direction, I've come to, I've cataloged so many excuses that people make for themselves as not to ask for anything for God. People are very, actually quite unused. Not that we're talking about asking for stuff from God. You know, this is, we're not the prosperity gospel peddlers. But people just don't ask, period. Uh, I joke, you know, often men trying to pray don't ask for the same reason they don't ask for direction, traffic directions, when they're lost. It's regarded as unmanly. And um, in middle class circles, it's regarded as unmanly to need prayer. So people keep secret the fact they're going to hospital from their pastors. Um, women may feel inhibited in asking for things because they've been told, well, that's being selfish. You're supposed to be available, you're supposed to be doing stuff for other people. You don't have any needs, you're not in touch with it for yourself. So one of the painful things we learn is just asking the question, what do we want to ask for? Um, and be, uh, in some sense, on, uh, break through the shame barrier of asking for what we need for the day. Lord, hold me steady in the day. Keep me from crazy, crazy activities like nonstop housework, which is trying to assuage my anxiety. Help me sit still today, um, whatever it is, we must identify asking and yearning and seeking, even on the most personal and simple basis, and also be then prepared to, to start asking God, God, come into this craziness of this life where people are being misled, deceived, and neglected, at a time of crisis, um, praying for those who are sacrificially working at the very front edge of the health, health crisis, working for those who are trying to enlighten the public and guide. Praying, especially for those for whom we have feelings of fury and vindictiveness, because Christ says, you pray for your enemies, which is impossible, but try it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, try it because uh, the corrosion of vindictiveness is a poison in the soul. And in some sense, to spit it out and take a sip of compassion, um, well, we must just try it. So this first major point is emotional honesty. Yes. Starting where we are and then simply asking for what we need. Yes. So basic, but somehow we we think it's all very complicated and difficult, and that right. we're not capable for it, right? <laughs> well, the advice you give to people who have not prayed for a long time or felt stymied is, do it in short bursts. Uh, if you set yourself up for feeling you're going to have some major prayer time or restart time, is you must sneak prayer in, and short bursts. Um, St. Benedict's advice, let prayer be brief, actually has quite a wide ranging uh, application. The other thing is, and I think this takes on to our second, the se second point, is I've used over years in teaching a question, which is, who does God want to be for you just now? The reason I smile when I uh, pose this question is, especially with clergy and anyone involved in the helping professions or even good church people, they think they've heard that question. But when the time comes for them to read back what they think I said, 90% of people say, who does God want you to be for him just now? 
something happens in the brain. And I've done workshops where we've focused on this for three days. And then at the end, when someone stands up to thank me for the weekend's work, they said, we've got so much work to do now because we've been left with this great question, who does God want to be for us? want us to be for him just now. And so there must be something to this question, which is we are so unused to thinking of the, what a spiritual master has called the wanting to be of God in our lives, a phrase that our friend Rowan William uses. Uh, it's coined by a teacher called Sebastian Moore. And it's a whole stance of faith, which is to say, God yearns to be for us, but to be for us in a way that particular meshes with the predicament, the plight, the opportunity we have. God is all in all, but who in particular do we want Christ to be for us just now? Which is, do you want God to hold you? Do you want God to arouse you because you feel stupefied with depression and anxiety? Do you want God to recruit you because you feel marginal, like, what can, how can I help? Um, God is advocate. God, I feel I'm on my own. I'm in a bureaucratic nightmare. I possibly will face addiction. Who's on my side? Be on my side. In some sense of the limitless facets to God's own person, the God of a hundred names, which particular aspect of God's active presence in my life do I want to experience him? And in some sense, I want you to be for me and this is a very intimate question, isn't it? It's, it? it's the sort of question that if couples can break through to that level, honey, just now, I need you to be this for me because of where I am, is a very powerful bond of truth and a, and a, a claim on the love that people have. So when we say to God, when we say to Christ, and praying to Christ is paramount now because Christ knows more about being a human than we do. Uh, right through death row and the rest of it. So who do I want Christ to be for me just now? But you're also asking who does, who do I, what do I think or who does God in God's self want for me? Yes. And how do I get at that? And how I do I get that's the because in some sense that is the cru the crux of the matter is yeah. is that God is unlikely to override or burst in on us with the truth of that although God is perfectly entitled to do that from time to time God may in some sense send the ball back into our court which is well if you want to know first try who you want to be for me and yeah. then send it back over the net. <laughs> You do me. And in, in, the, in the later segment uh, of today's session, we might think about ways in which we open ourselves to God touching us in the prayer time, giving us a sense of who indeed God wants to be for us just now, but through the mediation of scripture and other means by which we expose ourselves to being touched by God in precisely this way. I think my point is, we're not likely to be really able to ask the question, who does God want to be for us just now? People will say, oh, well, how do I know? <laughs> and I think God, God, God's answer is, well, start with who you, you'd yearn, who you would yearn. And in some sense, Prayer is such an extraordinary activity because it allows us to use words that are verboten in normal language, which is yearn. Most of us are not allowed to yearn for anything. We, we've not yearned for things in years. 
But in some sense, we might want to say, God, I yearn for you to be this for me, or I yearn for this. And Perhaps we should just pause because you've opened up such an enormous, you've ripped open our hearts here. Have yeah. I? I think there's some questions coming in and Amanda, let's take a couple at least at this point. <laughs> Absolutely. So we've had a number of questions coming in and a flood of them just came in. So I haven't quite gotten to them yet. Um, but I'll start. So one person asks, is petitionary prayer just a weaker form of contemplative prayer? I struggle more to contemplate, but I often feel as if petition is just the easy way out. Shall I try that? I know you've got lots to say about that, Martin. Yeah, please. You know, when we, it is true that in some sense, all prayer of asking is a form of contemplative prayer because we contemplate where God is in relation to something. So when we pray for someone who is, take a classic case, someone who is about to have a major operation is very sick. We are not asking God up there to, to zap the person down here with some kind of ray of grace. We are contemplating the fact that God is already identified with that person in compassion and suffering and love. And what prayer is, is God who is in a situation is asking us to join God in that situation by offering what we want and believe that God wants, which is a holy outcome of healing and life and renewal and ex all those good things that we want for the person that's in need. Or when we're praying for a young niece who's just graduating from high school and faces the enormous uncertainty of the launching of her further education now, uh, God is already with her and in her. And when we pray, we are joining God where God is already. And, and the Holy Spirit has kind of triggered an empathic response in us. And of course, no one knows how in petitionary prayer works, except that sometimes a feather on a scale pan tilts it. Our little smudge or blip of empathy who knows how it's joining hundreds of other things, threads that God is weaving together, and lo and behold, something wonderful can happen. But people do worry, don't they, Martin, that petitionary prayer is kind of second best, and we really all ought to be involved in contemplation. And there's something odd about this, because when Jesus was asked by his disciples how to pray. He gave yes. them a set of things right, to exactly. ask. No, no, no contemplative wisdom can sort of trump the core of Jesus' <laughs> message. And I think the, the, the thing that both have in common is this arousal of desiring, which we believe to be a response to the yearning of God. So contemplative prayer is the arousal of a yearning which is a kind of speechless longing. Um, petitionary prayer is an articulate longing focused on part of the texture of our common human condition, our being in all this together. And both of them are responses of arousal. And, and what they have in common is, is that they're both forms of, the, of God's arousal in us of empathic desire. So let's take one more question now, but then I think most people will want to hear your last input and then we can probably have time for several more. Amanda, what have you chosen next? So we've actually got a lot of questions around sort of selfishness and prayer. Um, this sort of question, so someone asked if the question, who do I want Christ to be for me, is making God in our own image. And there's a number of other questions that are sort of wondering, well, is, is this too self-focused? So I wonder if you might address that. 
Well, if I'd been very blunt, I would say that this kind of, this kind of response will be very common to th common knowledge to therapists is that we, we have been furnished off with a series of inner senses that quickly rationalize a kind of rule that we cannot really desire something fundamentally for our own bliss, our own health, our own goodness. That somehow this has been tabooed or forbidden. And therapists will often find that it has some childhood origins where you're selfish if you want, you, know, you, you can't go. If you want to go to university, you're being selfish. You need to go and work in order to, and so on. Um, so part of this is, if you have a dilemma like this, this is the starting point of prayer, which is, God, I have such mixed feelings. I feel very guilty if I ask something for myself. And yet, guide me now, because I'm in a dilemma. Can I ask this? Is this selfish of me to ask this? In some sense, that's the experience. No one can answer that question for you. They're saying the question is the prayer. And I say, if you have a dilemma like that, if I pray for Christ to be um, a hidden companion in a job I find dreary so that I can imagine him next to me in the cubicle and and that helps to realize that he participates in my boredom, my frustration. If, can I ask him to be that? But if I find myself saying, no, I can't really ask that, that's making Christ in my own image. Send the ball over the net to Christ. <laughs> ask him whether it's selfish or not. Offer the feelings of ambivalence. That is the prayer. That's the starting point. And we discover over time that um, people are radically unused to the idea that there is this presence who is wholly present for us and is more on our side than we know to be ourselves. Most people don't know how to be good to themselves. They are corrosive and non-cherishing towards themselves. Takes a long time to think of God for us. And I think people often um, understand the saying about loving your neighbor as yourself, as the latter being improperly selfish. But actually, of course, true love of ourselves is what God wants for us. So, that's another sort of exegetical unwinding of that dilemma, isn't it? Martin, would you like to go on to your third and major point? Because it's very practical. Um, and then we'll make sure we have plenty of time for the remaining questions. Right. Because if it, I mean, it, the conversation is not an ideal image for what prayer is, but nothing is ideal. You've got to have lots of images. And, you've got, and this is a pretty good starting point. The thing is about what people feel paralyzed in so much prayer is they feel they have to start the conversation. But if you ask the question, what would prayer be like if each and every time I allowed God to start the conversation so that I'm not seeking answers to pray, answers from God, but God is seeking an answer from me. And I think this very, it's, it sounds simplistic, but in some sense, it is a major restarting point for many people. And it introduces the possibility that there are forms of prayer that are basically receptive, which is say, can I sit still long enough in a place where I won't be burst in on and give myself just long enough 20 minutes or so for something to happen. In this case, it would be for me to tune in to who God wants to be for me by opening myself to some of the images of God's 
presence, activity, and goodness in scripture, and allowing them to impress or stimulate or impregnate my imagination enough for me to feel that they're opening up a felt sense of who God wants to be for me just now. So that my true response to prayer, my answer to God, is to let this happen so that God has been given the opportunity to touch me in some way in the prayer time. So praying with scripture is a fundamental spiritual practice where we don't ferret around in the text for hidden meanings or pull it apart in what passes for Bible study in many quarters, they're kind of picking it apart, or, or intellectually um, worrying about its context. Of life. There are all sorts of ways of approaching scripture. This approach would be primarily to expose ourselves to passages of scripture where there's some pregnant image of God waiting to be assimilated by us. And one of the, the most wonderful uh, definitions of prayer, it was given by Thomas Merton to a disciple of his in the closing months of his life in his hermitage. In prayer, we experience what we already possess through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and in our incorporation by baptism into Christ. You start where you are, and you deepen what you have, and you realize you're already there. Everything has been given to us in Christ. All we have to do is to experience what we already possess. And this quotation is very, very significant for me because it acts as an interpretation of what meditation with scripture really is. It's a sense of, if we only knew that Christ already dwelt in our heart, so the Holy Spirit was already a spring of water welling up to eternal life in our hearts. If we only knew that our lives are surrounded by God, encompassed by God, well, of course they are. And there is no shallow end with God. We're in the deep end already. That's why baptism is a critical rite of immersion. You get all of God from the beginning. So the question is not, how do I get God into my life? But how do I experience what is there already? So in some sense, praying with scripture is not a case of, ooh, I'm going to get zapped with an insight from heaven above to me down here below in the form of a message from God or some kind of intrusion. But rather, in prayer itself, there could be an arousal, an intuition, an awakening, an embracing, an accepting, a putting roots into something that's actually already real and already there to be discovered and experienced. Um, the, the story I've told more often, I think in 40 years, was a, an event that happened to me when I was a, a student before going to university. I was interested in field archeology. span I was interested in holy wells and springs in the county I lived in. And I heard rumors that I found in certain texts that there was a holy well at a certain place that had been completely lost. The last expedition to find it was unsuccessful. And I, one April day, I spent poking around in a field. And at the very end of the day, I realized the only place it could possibly be is where the cows were standing. And I <laughs> poked the cows away, dug through the manure, the flies, the piss, the stench. And underneath it, just two feet down, was a carved stone tablet and there's a wooden pipe coming out of medieval pipe. And sticking my hand down, I pulled out the sod and it instantly flowed as a crystal clear stream. This powerful image of a sense of, you know, it's been there all along. Our job is to dig through the shit and unplug it. 
<laughs> in some sense, which is there's no other place other than the confusion of our own hearts and acknowledgement that God is there. So without this being a sort of um, department of shameless commerce, uh, I wrote the book, The Word is Very Near You, to give three classic approaches to meditative prayer with passages of scripture. And all of them are some using either the imagination to empathically enter into a story in order to be emotionally available to it. And others are ways of simplifying our attention so that God can alert us in a text to a particular word or a phrase that if we would only just stay with that long enough, it will act as a kind of key to something that is bottled up or undiscovered. And simple as it might be, this particular word or phrase from a passage of scripture might just arouse or unlock or, or, or that we simply take it in in a fresh way. I suppose in some sense the classic paradigm of meditative prayer in using scripture would be taking the story like the foot washing where we read the story not from above or at arm's length but we picture ourselves in that circle around the little central table with our feet poking out and watching Christ go round until Christ comes to us. And for the first time in our lives, imaginative looking down at Christ in our prayer instead of looking up. If we look up to Christ in heaven, we're going to miss him most of the time because that's not, Christ is on the floor at our feet and the embarrassment or the reluctance to be attended to humbly by Christ will speak volumes. It certainly did for Peter, who is a hero of blurting stuff out, of saying, the, saying things aloud that we all feel. You're not gonna, I'm not going to let you do this. But in a prayer time in which we experience a kind of a sense of, I don't, I don't really want to let like, Christ do this for me. That's not, not my feet. I've got these ingrown toenails and all this keratin shedding and, and the athlete's foot. And it's, it, it's a symbol of what we don't want other people to see or touch. Um, and so that, that's a kind of example of all sorts of scriptural stories are waiting for us to be um, moments of truth, not in an intellectual or head trip way, but moments of heartfelt truth about what Christ was, who Christ truly is for us that he claims to be, he claims as his own. And the other forms of prayer, of course, are taking passages of scripture and reading them in a certain way of openness that we'll be waiting for a particular word or phrase to strike a chord and then we put aside the passage of scripture because that particular word or phrase is enough for that's it if we're reading a psalm we don't plow through it if a certain psalm verses rung a bell then in some sense a prayer could be as simple as ringing the bell again by repeating it and seeing what kind of opens up. Um, you're reading a psalm. That's why in Anglican spirituality, as in all classic spirituality, the psalms are paradigms um, and are the, the medium through which God touches the hearts of people who are prepared to be receptive towards them and let them strike a chord with us. Thank you, Martin. I, I love the story about the cows and the <laughs> <shit>. <laughs> Some 
some of us have had young children now or in the past and have only been able to pray for about five minutes in the bathroom. Um, but even that is time enough to open up this receptivity right. that you're describing in, in the activity of lection. Um, right. We now got a wonderful range of questions and I therefore would love to use the rest of our time on those. Uh, Amanda. Yes, we've got, as Sarah said, a number of really good questions. So I apologize in advance because we're not going to be able to get to all of them. Um, but I will, I, we will do what we can. Um, so um, someone asked, and I thought it might be helpful to ask both of you individually um, about suggesting a scriptural passage to start with. Um, You've mentioned Martin the Psalms. Are, is there a particular psalm or another passage of scripture that you might recommend for beginning again? Should I go first? Yes, certainly. You know, I think this is an opportunity to revisit the Gospels and to look, glance through stories until you find one that attracts you. You know, we can sort of just skim through and then say, actually, this is an attractive story. I will go there. And there are some stories which, which have the potential for attraction. I mean, I love the, the story where uh, women are bringing babies and toddlers who are very much at risk, you know, in, in Jesus' time, as they are in most of the world. It's children that die in the poverty-stricken world. And the disciples said, oh, take those kids away, keep them away from Jesus. And he says, no, let them come to me. And he took them into his arms. Allowing oneself to take part in a story like that can often be a means by which an adult genuinely re-experiences a very primal sense of God wanting to hold and cherish us whereas our adult selves have a thousand excuses for keeping Christ at arm's length. A story like that is a kind of sense of Christ's unconditional welcome to us. So that's the kind of story that I think is very eligible for starting. But if you feel a bit disabled about locating your own feelings or um getting into the, the visual surround of the text. I do think the Psalms provide a kickoff for raw emotion of the most yes. fantastic sort and don't expurgate them. Right. Um, um, I think uh, especially the Psalms of ascent towards the end of the Psalter, hmm. out of the depths of I cried unto thee, O Lord, um, 130. Um, uh, or Lord, you have searched me out and known me. Yeah. Um, which 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 ends with this terrible fury, but yeah. but psalmist is, is allowing us to experience fury before God, and it's very important not to erase that, in my view. Right. Nor to take it literally. I don't think the psalmist wants us to go and smash babies. No, I think the psalmist is expressing an ire which has to be expressed somewhere. And the best place to express it is before God. Right. So we've now got a much more difficult question. Um, I'm, I'm just locating it. Um, so someone asks, how is it that we should expect an our prayers to be answered? What if we're praying to ask for an end to food insecurity? homelessness, cancer, racism, etc., and no answer comes along for years, um, wouldn't that be frustrating? Um, why should I continue to pray when nothing happens? Well, um, nothing will happen most of the time that's visible to us. In some sense, if the, if the primal kind of praying that Jesus incited people to do was to pray for the coming of God's reign. The idea that you could tick a series of boxes within a month, which would indicate that that reign was, or, you know, kicking in in very specific ways is, is absurd. What you're really saying is, 
if I'm, I'm, I'm start, I pray to yearn for what God yearns for. I'm learning to, to ask for the coming about of what God yearns to bring about. And in numerous cases, any direct evidence that the prayer is being answered will not be visible to us. But, you know, I was in, I'm, I've always been fascinated by tapestries and visiting a tapestry workshop fascinated me to see how threads that were used in one part of the pattern passed out of sight behind the back of the tapestry only to emerge somewhere else. And one of the, one of the mysteries about prayer is a sense that we're, we're so bound together in this that a prayer that I offer for a specific outcome may still be used by God for an outcome that I can't yet see, but the God who is working from the back of the tapestry can. We're basically offering our God, we're offering God the energy of our empathic yearning for God to use in whatever way God can and will. And it won't always be um, visible to us. And the praying continues through the frustration. You know, Christ, that passage where Christ, this is what Christ taught for those who were tempted to lose heart. Um, and he, he talked about a persistence and endurance. And in some sense, there's a kind of defiance about prayer, which is says, to hell with results, I'm going to pray anyway. Which is to say, to hell with my need you know, to, for instant results. I'm just going to do it, even though I won't be able to see the outcome. Um, and in some sense, um, who are we to sort of think that we aren't just, we're, we're one voice in a chorus. And we certainly believe that certain cumulative effects happens when people participate en masse. This is going to happen with our awakening about racism. Is, I was going to I, raise that now. Yes, I, won't, I won't see tomorrow an end of the desperate self-defense of white supremacy as its stories start to crumble. But by praying for the dismantling and undermining of the white supremacist narratives, I'm joining a chorus. And if, if the story is still kicking and struggling by the time I die, at least I'd have spent the last 10 years of my life praying for its collapse. <laughs> and for a new spirit of uh, collaboration, a unity of mutual respect and so on. Of course, it may be more disturbing than that because the more I pray for this, the more I have to be changed as well. Not quite. Um, because surely prayer, even if it doesn't get the instantaneous results I want, is in virtue of my yeah. tuning in to the God who is always longing to be for me, right. um, changing me. I, Sometimes I, in ways I didn't ask for. Right. The, the thing is, the prayer of asking is not something we dreamt up and decided to do while God said, oh, what are they up to? They're asking for things. <laughs> Pr praying is evidence that God is recruiting our hearts. It's up to God to recruit us. And we just, we just, um, we are vibrating with empathy, with God's yearning. I mean, we can always put our hand on the string and stop doing it and turn away and give up. But as long as we're actually empathically vibrating with God's compassion, yearning and passion, then no argument's going to stop us because actually it's an, it's an outcome of God's arousal of us. So it's not for us to decide well, I'll stop, I'll stop praying for things because nothing really happens. It's God gets to decide what happens. And what God is deciding is to recruit us 
recruit our voices, recruit our passion, recruit our empathy, partly to change and convert us, but partly to make available to him some energy that God can use, God knows how. Should we take another, Amanda? Yes, I think we have time for one more. And I, I, um, this is a really interesting question that I think is sort of asking about prayer in the context of the church community. Yeah. So this person is asking, what prayer advice would you give to persons recovering from trauma from experiences with church leaders or in the church? So how, how does our prayer life relate to our community life together? Well, that is a huge question, isn't it? Um, one of the things that's going to come up in prayer is disappointment and disillusionment with the faults, the defects of the Christian community and particular perpetrators of behavior which is incompatible with the spirit of Christ. Mm. And we have, there's no other way except to pray compassionately for ourselves through that because churches can be arenas of victimization as we know only too well. Um, I suppose one of the answer is um, to acknowledge that prayer is a place where God yearns to be for us a healer from the wounds we may have suffered in our own church, that God, God is holy on our side as our advocate. And, and basically to ask for the kind of healing which would give us our voices back. And we start to feed back to God. This is what I yearn for the church to be. This is what I long for it to be. Um, help me be a co-creator with you of the kind of community you want to forge now in the place where we're at. Can I, can I be a voice, a creative voice in the reshaping of the community as well as being someone who has been injured by the defects of its of the church. Sarah. <laughs> well, I, I, I think prayer precisely as a place of vulnerability, which is so closely related to the erotic realm, yeah. the realm of learning, yeah. makes it a very devastating place to revisit when one's been wounded erotically. Yeah, yeah. Abused. And this, uh, and we need to ask for help. <laughs> yeah. um, we, need, we need to ask for people to pray for us. Yeah. That's one of the things I think we don't say enough either, that there are times in our lives or circumstances when we feel so devastated or so busy or so anxious that our first act is to ask others yes. to help. Yes. And there's yes. nothing wrong with that. That's not selfish. <laughs> That's no. utterly selfish. Right. And that's what God wants. God wants us all to pray for each other and in each other for the restoration of the kingdom um, because that's another thing that prayer does. It makes us aware and conscious of and cognizant of others who are on this journey. And we begin to see that we are much closely, more closely bound up both in hope and in devastation yeah. than we thought, which is also, of course, terrifying if you've been abused by a person in leadership. Yes. Um, and I also think it's important not to press people in who've been traumatized into, as it were, false and easy requests or demands for forgiveness of their abuser. Mm -hmm. That's much too quick a uh, solution. Um, I hope that I may be able to come back to this actually in later sessions. Indeed, many of the themes um, that we've picked up today, we will return to. And I'm going to ask Amanda to send me all these other questions I haven't answered, so that in the remaining three sessions, um, I'm, I myself or my other interlocutors will be able to address them. I'm so grateful to all of you for sending them in. Martin, I want to thank you now. It's been such a joy to hear you speak again. I think oh. we left first about 30 years ago, 
and we've been friends on and off and right. just to hear your humor and insight and absolutely earthy sense of humanity um, is such a gift to the church. I do thank it's, you. It's been an honor. Thank you. Next week, we're going to look at the Desert Fathers and Mothers, the famous harlots of the desert, and think about um, what they represent for us today in times of solitude because they chose a prayer of solitude, which they discovered actually was also a prayer of a, a place of interconnection. But just to end today, I, I want to say, if I may, two prayers. I always end with prayer. And the first is a prayer for the sick in our country and in the world today. And the second is the prayer for today, our collect in the Episcopal Church for today. Let us pray. O most mighty and merciful God, in this time of grievous sickness, we flee unto you for succor. Deliver us, we beseech you, from our peril. Give strength and skill to all those who minister to the sick. Prosper the means made use of for their care and cure. And grant that, perceiving how frail and uncertain our life is, we may apply our hearts and prayers to that heavenly wisdom which leads to eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And the collect for today. O Lord, mercifully receive the prayers of your people who call upon you and grant that they may know and understand what things they ought to do and also may have grace and power faithfully to accomplish them. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.